Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Today we're looking at the English Reformation. All too often, the break from Rome that occurred in the 16th century is explained, almost dismissed, as simply being due to Henry VIII's desire to marry Anne Boleyn that denying this royal personage his current wish resulted in a tantrum that separated England from the Holy See of Rome. Because after all, Henry VIII was no fan of Martin Luther. In fact, the Reformation in England has long roots, ones that certainly predate any stirring in Henry VIII's heart, or pants for that matter. And these foundations are what we're going to be exploring today. But before we take a look at this, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. History Hit has hundreds of programmes online, over 1,000 podcast episodes on their award-winning podcast network, and 5,000 history-related travel articles. And what's more, new content is being added all the time because they launch 15 new podcast episodes and two new programmes every week. Whilst Dan Snow's History Hit continues to be the world's leading history podcast, they now have four more podcast series. They have The Ancients, Warfare, Gone Medieval and Not Just the Tudors, which is hosted by Susanna Lipscomb. History Hit is like Netflix, but for history. While I tend to focus on early modern English history on this channel, I do find other areas fascinating. History Hit offers viewers a massive span of historical material. I just watched Legacies of Eugenics, where Marius Turder guides us around various displays from an exhibition on that very topic and its legacies that took place in September 2021. Click the link in my description box to find out more and to subscribe to History Hit. As an added bonus, my viewers are able to get 50% off your subscription for the next three months by using code READINGTHEPAST. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. But now, it's time to look at the roots of Reformation. Today we're going to look at the life and legacy of a figure who some have come to refer to as the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe, also known as Dr Evangelicus. As is the case with many individuals from history who were not born to rule, much of Wycliffe's early life is subject to educated guesswork. We aren't sure when he was born but the 1320s have been offered as a likely time period. Thomas Walsingham, who was a chronicler writing in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, asserts that Wycliffe was a northerner. Indeed, Anne Hudson and Anthony Kenny explain that, quote, There is good reason to think that Wycliffe was a member of the Richmondshire family from the North Riding village of Wycliffe. Wycliffe was educated at Oxford and across his career there, he can be connected to Merton, Balliol and the Queen's Colleges. His ordination to the priesthood seems to have occurred in 1351. He was Master of Balliol by the end of 1360, but he would need to give this up in order to enjoy his next promotion to Balliol's benefice. Now, a benefice is a grant of property for a priest that comes with a source of income. And the benefice in question from Balliol is the one of Fillingham in Lincolnshire, which Wycliffe took up from May 1361. Then, around the middle of that same decade, the 1360s, Wycliffe obtained the Prebend of Aust. A Prebend is a church or cathedral stipend that was traditionally granted to a clergyman, such as a canon. Wycliffe swapped Fillingham for the rectory of Luggershaw in Buckinghamshire in November 1368, which was in turn exchanged for the rectory of Lutterworth in Leicestershire in 1374. The king was involved in the Lutterworth exchange. 
Wycliffe would come to royal attention and be drawn into royal service by the 1370s. Because on the 26th of July 1374, he was chosen to be one of five new envoys to be sent to Bruges by Edward III's government so that they might negotiate with the Pope's agents about clerical taxation and provision. Unfortunately, this round of discussions would close without a resolution. But despite this stalemate, it does seem that Wycliffe was still viewed as a useful tool by certain members of the royal family. In a few of my videos from a while ago, which I will be leaving linked, I've made mention of Edward III's son, John of Gaunt. Among other things, he was the progenitor of the Beaufort line from which the Tudors sprang. He was a target for the so-called Peasants' Revolt, and he was viewed as an enemy by many of his contemporary nobles and churchmen. And as we will see, Wycliffe was also willing and able to generate his own band of enemy churchmen that would look to bring him down, if at all possible. Because Wycliffe had been spreading a message in Oxford and London that resulted in him being summoned by John of Gaunt to appear before the King's Council in September 1376. Perhaps the intention was that he would be warned about his teaching by this body. Thomas Walsingham suggests something else was going on. He claims that John of Gaunt had actually selected Wycliffe as a weapon that might be used to challenge the church, and in particular, the churchmen that were gathered against him, Gaunt. The alternative is that Gaunt and his fellows on the council were hoping to encourage Wycliffe to cease his inflammatory preaching and teaching. If Wycliffe was simply warned by the King's Council, he doesn't seem to have been put off. Because within months, on the 19th of February 1377, he was called to St Paul's to answer for his continued behaviour, this time before Archbishop Simon Sudbury, before William Courtney, the Bishop of London, and before other bishops. On this occasion, he was charged with sedition for his preaching. Wycliffe didn't come alone. He had support that included John of Gaunt and Henry, Lord Percy. And when these parties met at St Paul's, tensions ran high, both inside and outside the church. So among those who were at the hearing, and also among the general public, who had come to hear its ruling. So much so that a riot broke out, which ultimately resulted in this meeting being abandoned. And perhaps because of the confusion, it remains unclear what, if any further action, was ordered to be taken against Wycliffe as a result of this hearing. Not long afterwards, on the 22nd of May 1377, Pope Gregory XI issued five papal bulls against Wycliffe, his beliefs and preaching. But they would not reach their intended recipients in London or Oxford for months. And in the meantime, Wycliffe was free to carry on writing and working. He was writing to assert the legitimacy of withholding taxes from the papal collectors in times of national need. And this, I think, understandably and clearly, would only have compounded the animosity that was being aimed at Wycliffe from those who already despised his heresy. All of this was occurring in the very same year that King Edward III died and was succeeded by his grandson, King Richard II. Thomas Walsingham was not a fan of Wycliffe, and he describes how he, quote, in the schools and elsewhere, he publicly asserted mistaken heretical doctrines, which were quite absurd, and an attack on the position of the universal church. He complains of Wycliffe assembling followers to spread his heresy and errors, which included, according to Walsingham, the following assertions. Quote, that the Eucharist on the altar after the sacrament is not the real body of Christ, but its symbol. That the Church of Rome is not the head of all the churches more than any other one church, and that greater power was not given by Christ to Peter than to any other apostle. That, as regards the keys of the church, 
the Pope at Rome does not have greater power than any other ordained priest. That if there is a God above, temporal lords can legally and rightfully take away the property owned by a church that transgresses. That if a temporal lord knows of a church that has transgressed, he is bound under threat of damnation to remove its temporal possessions from it. That the gospel is sufficient guide in this life for any Christian and that all the other rules of the saints, which are observed as rules of life by the various religious orders, do not add any more perfection to the gospel than does whitewash to a wall. That neither the Pope nor any prelate of the church should have prisons to punish sinners, but that any sinner should be able to go freely wherever he wants and do what he likes. Now, I don't know about you, but this is all sounding pretty Reformation-y to me. Wycliffe would also criticise the abuses that he viewed as being enacted within the church of his day. Indulgences, penances, confession, excommunication, images, pilgrimages, prayers for the dead, clerical possession of property, all of which, he pointed out, shared something in common with a belief in papal authority. Namely, that there was no scriptural basis to justify or support any of them. Whatever the Pope may order in Rome, Wycliffe does seem to have been fairly well insulated against the many unpleasant consequences that might be expected to befall an individual who had earned the Pope's ire through alleged heresy. Thus it was, in the spring of 1378, when Wycliffe found himself at Lambeth, to answer the charges that the Pope had set down, that the proceedings were interrupted by one Sir Lewis Clifford. Clifford announced and claimed that he had been sent by the young King Richard II's mother, Joan of Kent, and it was her wish that those at Lambeth would not find against Wycliffe. Three years after this hearing, in May 1381, a committee in Oxford condemned as heretical anyone who preached against the doctrine of transubstantiation. This is the belief that the bread and wine of the Eucharist transform into the literal body and blood of Christ following their consecration. This kind of preaching was something that Wycliffe had done and was still doing. Wycliffe wasn't quick to agree to comply with this new state of affairs. Indeed, John of Gaunt is said to have come in person to order him to keep quiet on the issue. It does seem that this may have been something that made him feel that remaining at Oxford was now untenable, because he would leave for his rectory at Lutterworth later that year. The following June, 1381, saw the Peasants' Revolt erupt. It was a time of violence, which saw one of Wycliffe's earlier judges, who was the Lord Chancellor and Archbishop of Canterbury, Simon of Sudbury, be executed by rebels on Tower Hill, alongside the Lord Treasurer, Robert Hales. In addition, John of Gaunt's Savoy Palace was also burned. The rebels involved in this uprising had the option to have their spiritual needs met, and therefore potentially also their actions encouraged, because there was a priest among their number, John Ball. Like Wycliffe, Ball had also been on the receiving end of censure from the bishops for his own allegedly heretical preaching, and these two men certainly voiced some of the same challenges to the mainstream religious orders of the day. But it is worth mentioning that Ball's issues with the bishops had been going on from at least 1355. So any early attempts, indeed ongoing attempts, that seek to position him as Wycliffe's acolyte arguably an individual who is corrupted by him, appear to be a concerted attempt to make Wycliffe partly responsible for the violence and unrest that had unfolded during the Peasants' Revolt. Certainly, the perceived role of irregular preaching in emboldening those who were involved in the Peasants' Revolt may have contributed to the action that was taken against Wycliffe's writings, preaching and teaching in the following year. 1382. Another council was convened, this time at Blackfriars, which would ultimately find 24 conclusions of Wycliffe's that were fit to be condemned. 
they were as follows. 1. That the material substance of bread and wine remains after the consecration in the sacrament of the altar. 2. That the accidents do not remain without the subject after the consecration in the same sacrament. 3. That Christ is not in the sacrament of the altar identically, truly and really in his proper corporeal presence. 4. That if a bishop or priest lives in mortal sin, he does not ordain or consecrate or baptise. 5. That if a man has been truly repentant, all external confession is superfluous to him or useless. 6. That it is not founded in the gospel that Christ instituted the Mass. 7. That God ought to be obedient to the devil. 8. That if the Pope is foreordained to destruction and a wicked man, and therefore a member of the devil, no power has been given to him over the faithful of Christ by anyone, unless perhaps by the Emperor. 9. That since Urban VI, no one is to be acknowledged as Pope, but all are to live in the way of the Greeks, under their own laws. 10. To assert that it is against sacred scripture that men of the church should have temporal possessions. 11. That no prelate ought to excommunicate anyone unless he first knows that the man is excommunicated by God. 12. That a prelate thus excommunicating is thereby a heretic or excommunicate. 13. That a prelate excommunicating a clerk who has appealed to the king or to a council of the kingdom on that very account is a traitor to God, the king and the kingdom. 14. That those who neglect to preach or to hear the word of God or the gospel that is preached because of the excommunication of men are excommunicate and in the day of judgment will be considered as traitors to God. 15. To assert that it is allowed to anyone, whether a deacon or a priest, to preach the word of God, without the authority of the apostolic see, or of a Catholic bishop, or of some other which is sufficiently acknowledged. 16. To assert that no one is a civil lord, no one is a bishop, no one is a prelate, so long as he is in mortal sin. 17. That temporal lords may, at their own judgment, take away temporal goods from churchmen who are habitually delinquent. Or that the people may, at their own judgment, correct delinquent lords. 18. That tithes are purely charity. And that parishioners may, on account of the sins of their curates, detain these and confer them on others at their will. 19. That special prayers applied to one person by prelates or religious persons are of no more value to the same person than general prayers for others in a like position are to him. 20. That the very fact that anyone enters upon any private religion whatever renders him more unfitted and more incapable of observing the commandments of God. 21. That saints who have instituted any private religions whatever as well of those having possessions as of mendicants, have sinned in thus instituting them. 22. That religious persons living in private religions are not of the Christian religion. 23. That friars should be required to gain their living by the labour of their hands and not by mendicancy. 24. That a person giving alms to friars or to a preaching friar is excommunicate, also the one receiving. There is, if I'm being very kind, some dramatic licence, shall we say, in the assertion that some of these conclusions were actually held by Wycliffe or indeed any of his supporters, with the alleged call for God to be obedient to the devil being, I think, a fairly obvious example. 
The overstating of Wycliffe's opinions and his involvement in various things is seemingly a recurring factor with regard to his life and legacy. And for me, a really clear example of this can be found in the name that has been given to the first translation of the Bible into English, or rather, into Middle English, to be exact. And this text was created over a number of years at the end of the 14th century. This heavily contested text is, to this day, called Wycliffe's Bible. Wycliffe's contemporary, the chronicler Henry Knighton, wrote, quote, that Master John Wycliffe translated the gospel from Latin into the language not of angels, but of Englishmen, so that he made that common and open to the laity and to women who were able to read, and spread the evangelist pearls to be trampled by swine. While Wycliffe certainly did translate texts into Middle English, while he was involved in translating the Bible into Middle English, by naming it Wycliffe's Bible, it almost seems as if he were working alone on it, if he were perhaps the sole translator, or indeed solely overseeing the whole thing. But one thing that people are almost 100% sure of, having looked at the text and the translation choices that were made, is that in the creation of this text, Wycliffe was not working alone. As we learned earlier in this video, Wycliffe removed himself to Lutterworth in 1381, and he would remain there for the rest of his life. It is believed that Wycliffe suffered a stroke on the 20th of December 1384, from which he would not recover. And indeed, Wycliffe would die three days later on December the 31st, 1384. He would be buried in the churchyard at Lutterworth. However, he would not be permitted to rest in peace, because Wycliffe and his works were determined to still be heretical for many years to come. So much so, that in 1428, which, for those keeping track, was more than 40 years after Wycliffe had died, the then Bishop of London, who was acting on the orders of Pope Martin V, commanded that Wycliffe's remains be exhumed, burnt, and scattered. Still, the memory of Wycliffe endured, and indeed he features a number of times in John Fox's Acts and Monuments, which is also known as the Book of Martyrs. I will, of course, leave my video on this work by Fox linked. But here is how Fox describes Wycliffe. This next quotation is taken from the 1583 edition of Fox's text, which means that it was published 199 years after Wycliffe's death. The quotation reads as follows. Not many years passed. God, seeing idolatry, superstition, hypocrisy and wicked living used in this realm, raised up that godly, learned man, John Wycliffe, to preach unto our fathers repentance and to exhort them to amend their lives to forsake their papistry and idolatry, their hypocrisy, superstition, and to walk in the fear of God. His exhortations were not regarded. He, with his sermons, was despised. His books and he himself after his death were burned. What followed? They slew their right king and set up three wrong kings on a row, under whom all the noble blood was slain up and half the commons there too. In this, I think that Fox appears to be connecting the disregarding of Wycliffe's message to the turmoil of the Wars of the Roses, as if it is somehow a principal cause, which, to my mind, is a bit of a reach. Nevertheless, on with the rest of the quotation. What in France? And with their own sword infighting among themselves for the crown, and the land brought half to a wilderness in respect of that it was before. O oh, extreme plagues of God's vengeance! In this section, Fox, I would say, is arguably on firmer ground, as the French wars of religion were, as the name certainly hints, about faith and how it should be practised. Roman Catholics and Protestants fought each other bitterly for the soul of their nation. 
But now let's look at the very last section of the Fox quotation that I was hoping to discuss with you. Since that time, even of late years, God, once again having pity of this realm of England, raised up his prophets, namely William Tyndall, Thomas Bilney, John Frith, Dr Barnes, Jerome Garrett, Anthony Person, with diverse other, which both with their writings and sermons earnestly laboured to call us unto repentance, that by this means the fierce wrath of God might be turned away from us. But how were they entreated? How were their painful labours regarded? They themselves were condemned and burnt as heretics, and their books condemned and burnt as heretical. The very martyrs who Fox has venerated throughout this book are here being positioned as the very heirs of Wycliffe in terms of the messages they delivered, what they called for, how they were received, and how they were ultimately treated. Some questions that we may wish to ask ourselves could include How responsible was Wycliffe for the English Reformation? What about the effect of his texts and his ideas moving overseas, travelling across the continent? Because they certainly did. So with that in mind, would Martin Luther or John Calvin have called for the changes that they ended up calling for without Wycliffe? And if not... Would the Reformation have therefore looked different had Wycliffe never been born? Would it even have happened? But why were Wycliffe's contemporaries, and indeed later historians, so keen seemingly to position him as some kind of lone innovator, a leader, maybe even a rebel? Now, I have my own opinions on some of these things, but I am definitely looking forward to reading all of yours. So what do you think? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. Or you can find me elsewhere on social media, and I will leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. So do follow me over on some or all of them so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please consider sharing it with your friends. Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And at some point, I'm sure I will be able to stop reminding you of this. I don't know when, but today is not that day. Because if you think you're subscribed, please have a little check now. Just make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. The good thing is that while you are there checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, it's a great time to also hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu that will appear so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.